Today's interview is with Rachel Lancaster, and Rachel is the creator of the Magnificent Midlife Community, and she's written a book uh, with that same title, uh, Magnificent Midlife, and we talk about her expertise. She shares her knowledge, and it's very fascinating. We cover a lot of topics in this episode. Uh, We talk about ageism. We talk about dry vaginas <laughs> specifically, which is a menopausal. If you don't know about it, you will soon learn about it. Uh, and it will probably happen to you. And it's not fun. But we also talk about whales. And uh, whales, it's a very interesting uh, thing that whales have in common with humans. And she shares an amazing quote, which I found very powerful. At the very end, I'm going to share it. Uh, I do weekly quotes for my audience, and uh, I'm excited to share that one because I was like, wow, that's good. So she's delightful. She knows a lot. She's been through it. She has a backstory about early menopause. And so I invite you to listen to this amazing episode, and I'm sure you're going to learn something. Welcome to another episode of Not Your Average Lives. And today I have with me Rachel Lancaster. Did I say that right, Rachel? Yep. I know she's British and I sometimes they <laughs> pronounce things different. And I was, I forgot to ask you that before I hit record. So she is the founder of Magnificent Midlife, which is an online hub celebrating and empowering women over 40. And she has a backstory as a lot of my guests do, which is why I find them so interesting. Uh, but she has a, a backstory about having early menopause when she turned 51 and she's now 56. And so I am very excited to talk about menopause because it's something that uh, I've dealt with. And we, most of my listeners are probably dealing with or have dealt with, I'm kind of past it now, which is kind of nice. Uh, But yeah, it's not a subject that I talk about a lot on the podcast. So welcome to the program. Hello, Laurie. It's lovely to be here. It's lovely to have you. And I can listen to your accent all day long. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. So you, and you also are an, are an author. I need to mention that. And you sent me yes. your book yesterday. I have not had a chance to read it, but I did skim it. So um, I do want to give a plug to that and we'll have a link in the show notes as well. Um, But it's, it's the same title, right? The Magnificent Midlife. Yeah. It's called Magnificent Midlife, Transform Your Middle Years, Menopause and Beyond. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So I have a question for you because um, I get this a lot, but I'm a little bit older than you being 63. But sometimes when I talk about midlife, I get the reaction of we're not midlife anymore. So I, so I kind of have been uh, I, switching to kind of a later talking about later in life. Um, maybe I even need to start talking about act three because Jane Fonda talks about the three acts in life and act three. Um, but that implies you're done at 90 and I don't plan to be done at 90. So <laughs> it's oh, like the chapter three is not the last chapter in, in my book. Um, so yeah. So do you ever have any resistance to the whole, you know, midlife and people being 56 and people think, and they do the math. It's like, well, you're not really midlife anymore. Well, I've been trying to sell services and concepts to women who don't want to be identified. Uh, <laughs> it's quite difficult. It's like in denial. To, exactly, they're in denial. And I think there's a really big difference as well between midlife over here in the UK and midlife in the States, because I know a lot of women in their 60s who say, I'm in midlife. And I'm thinking, are you going to live to 120 then? <laughs> okay. Um, so for me, I, I kind of think it's 40 to 60. That's what I think. But I think in America, it starts much later. That's what I've noticed. That's really interesting, interesting to me. Yeah. 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 So can you talk about what happened to you at 41 that you realized that you were entering menopause? I was in, I think I was earlier than my mother because they say you should use your mother as an example. And I was right around 50. It's interesting too, because before I hit record, she's in her second marriage and I'm in my second marriage and she's been married 12 years. I've been married 13. And so I was, and you said, because you hit early menopause, you had just met him and you were going through it. Same here. I mean, I, I was, we got married when I was 50 and that was about the time I was hitting menopause. So Um, yeah, I was hot flashes really bad and all, all of that that came with it. So what were your signs? 
Well, the weirdest thing is, you see, I didn't have any signs. This is what was mm. very strange. So I'd met this lovely man and we had finally decided that it'd be rather nice to try and have a child together, even though he'd got three and I'd got one. It was a bit about a fly in the ointment because he'd already had a vasectomy. Ah. <laughs> I, I don't half pick them. Um, so <laughs> we thought, I thought it would be sensible for me to go and check my hormones out before he went under the knife. Well, good thing. And, <laughs> Exactly. So I went to get a hormone test and I was told that I had the hormone profile of a postmenopausal woman. And I was sent away from the doctors with a prescription for Primarin, um, a hormone replacement therapy, because it was 10 years earlier than average menopause age of 51. Me being me. And that would I just keep things like that would keep you like more estrogen coming through your system. Is that it, the it idea was, there? It, what I was told then was that it was to protect my bones and my heart from 10 years less of estrogen. Got so it. the platinum, what I was told was go on it until you reach average menopause age of 51. And then, you know, you make your decision then. So I, I didn't want to go on it. I didn't fill the prescription. Um, and I did a lot of digging because I like to explore things. And I eventually found a nutritionist who put me on a special diet and gave me a special tincture, a herbal tincture. Um, and the diet was specifically about balancing my blood sugar levels and eating really good stuff and organic and no alcohol and no sugar and no caffeine. And within five weeks of starting this diet, I had a bleed. So that was a bit confusing. So you had so your period had actually stopped. When you went in well, for your I, I, that I suppose was the only symptom I hadn't really noticed. I hadn't noticed, but I think my periods had gone a bit skew with. Yes, mm. that by yeah. skew with, sorry, that's a very English expression. Yeah, that they 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 kind of gone missing a bit. I but I hadn't noticed. You see, this was this is looking back. I lived a very very stressful life. I wasn't in tune with my body at all. So I hadn't noticed these things. I was just, you know, I was like going on adrenaline and, and working really hard, very stressful. I was in a new relationship. So I was. Yeah, I think you're more in tune with your cycles when you're like reproducing and you're like, oh, when is my next period? And you're more, you know, uh, maybe, I, but maybe I, I'd never, I'd never really listened. Uh, <laughs> that, now, did you I think decide that was part of the problem? Yeah. Did you decide that w w what happened with the whole deciding to have another child? while you were going so, through this process. So I, so I got the period back. So then mm -hmm. I went back to the doctor. I had another hormone test and I was told that everything was fine. So he went for the reverse vasectomy. We didn't get the baby, unfortunately, but I've decided that the book is actually my baby. I have birthed the book instead of a baby. And yeah, you get to find other babies and I love that. Yeah. 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 And it's all okay. It's not, you know, I dreamt of having another child for years, but um, I'm very fortunate. I have one of my own and I have three stepchildren, mm -hmm. but, um, but it wasn't to be, but what that taught me was a, the doctors know nothing about menopause because I don't even know whether the diagnosis was correct. Now I know that they don't like doing those hormone tests because our hormones can fluctuate so much from day to day. We can present as postmenopausal one day and everything's fine, you know, the next day. So, the diagnosis might have been wrong, but that was the path I was set on that I had gone through early menopause. And so my hormones remained pre-menopausal for about nine months. And then it went back to how it had been supposedly post-menopausal. So I waited for about three more years. And then I had a, a bone scan and I was found to have borderline osteopenia in my hip, which is the precursor to osteoporosis. And the doctor, I was in the care of a specialist early menopause team by then. And they said to me, look, just go and have a bone scan. If you're fine, you don't need to take the HRT. But if there are any problems, we would like you to take the hormone therapy, please. So when I had this result, I thought, OK, Rachel, suck it up. And at that stage, I was about 45 by then. I went on the hormone therapy, but I had always made it choice my decision was I would go on it until average menopause age of 51 and then I would come off it and I have learned so much about how we can support our hormones naturally 
you know, stress, so important, exercise, so important, balancing those blood sugar levels, so important, getting rid of the toxicity in our lives, because there's a cost to modern life. There really is, you know, we live such high adrenaline lives, we want to have it all. And I say women, we can have it all, but not necessarily all at the same time. Mm. And I got into trouble. I didn't manage my stress well. I clearly wasn't eating as well as I could have done. They found that air pollution can cause early menopause. Well, I've always lived in the most polluted places on the planet, you know. So who knows whether that level of toxicity and then the toxicity that we have in our cleaning products and our personal products, you know, everything we slap on our face or our body has got all these ingredients in it. But sometimes we can't identify. We don't know what's in there, you know. So who knows? It, it's all, you know, it's all kind of like it's an area of discovery. But I learned so much and I wanted to communicate that to people. And I also realized that it was my own ageism against myself that made me have such a bad reaction to the diagnosis in the first place. Because I left that doctor's office feeling like a shriveled up old prune. And nobody had actually said that to me. But guess what? There's a drip, drip, drip marketing message over the years that women, we lose our value as we get older, menopause is the beginning of the end what is the point of a non-fertile woman what is she supposed to do you know yeah. what do we do yeah you know and all of those things you know had got inside my head and I had taken it on board and it was eventually that I started to create new narratives for myself and I learned things that I then applied to look after myself better and I wanted to let everybody know about this stuff. So that's why I wrote the book. Yeah. So you had a life before 41. What did you do? You mentioned uh, that earlier when we, before I hit uh, record that you lived in New York for three years. I did. And you live in yeah. London now. So I lived in China before that. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Those, those yeah. are polluted cities. <laughs> oh yeah. Shanghai, Beijing, New York, London, Birmingham, Leeds. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're all very big cities and high heavily polluted places yeah yeah so what was your career did you uh, you say you say you had a daughter and you have some stepchildren now so did you raise her and that was your, no, your state you, oh you have a son oh, okay you're yeah, a son. Yeah. it's a son all right yeah so um yeah so what did you do as you know when you were raising I him worked, and I worked in what's called financial PR, financial public relations. So it's based around doing communications for companies who are either listed on the stock exchange or who are involved in financial services. Um, so it's pretty high powered stuff. I was mainly working with listed companies, so stock exchange driven. So, you know, it was pretty intense. And I did that all over the world. I did projects all over the world. So, yeah, yeah, that's I so neat. Around. Yeah. And worked in London. How long did you live in China? China that was before when I was studying in China. So I lived oh. in China for two years. Yeah. Wow. That's so worldly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and so, yeah. So tell me about your book. And you you're telling me that it's in three phases. Um, so it's jam packed with information. Uh, you know, I looked at it, it's like over 200 pages long. So, what was the. Um, when you were going into writing the book and you wanted to share what you'd learned and the message that you thought people needed to hear, um, what, how did you decide to break it down into three phases and what are those three phases? Well, I'd read lots of books about menopause and they'd all been pretty negative, the ones that I read. Um, and I'd read books about aging well and they were just talking about aging well. It wasn't talking about aging in the context of menopause and, and midlife. And then I'd read a few books, especially um, the one called um, This Chair Rocks by Ashton Applewhite. And she absolutely changed my life. Um, and that was about ageism. But I wanted to write a book that brought them all together because I think I believe that ageism really kicks in around midlife and menopause. Um, I think that around 45, 50, that's when women start to really become aware of the ageism and I think it's because the patriarchy doesn't much like 
women who don't have a role creating babies you know that's what we're supposed to do and when we're not doing it you know what are we supposed to do so the three phases of the book the first one is about unpicking all of the negative narratives around menopause and a lot of those are the same or similar narratives around ageism and gendered ageism so it's unpicking those it's taking um uh, what's the word oh, my mind's gone blank but a brain fog here taking inspiration from other cultures because we tend to assume that our experience is universal yes and when it comes to menopause and when it comes to aging it isn't um, other cultures do it differently in cultures where women have more status as they get older there's a correlation that they have an easier experience of menopause I find that absolutely fascinating what so is a culture I, that does that so for example um in East Asia, in China and Japan, where traditionally the women, you know, they may not have had masses of status when they were younger, but as they age, they get more status. Um, and also the diet is so different in those countries. So they have a lot of natural phytoestrogens in their diet naturally. So that's a lot of soy products, for example. They don't eat as much dairy. They have a very different diet. And I want to, I'm asking questions about, you know, the influence of their diet on, you know, their experience of menopause. They don't have the same caffeine. They don't have the same level of alcohol as we have, you know, in the West. So it's very, all of these things are very interesting. So I dig into these in the first section of the book and I look at, you know, other cultures, what we can learn from other cultures, what we can, you know, adopt and, and ways of thinking. Because what I've established is that this gendered ageism, it's worst in um, what I call Anglo cultures. So by Anglo, I mean the UK, the US, Australia, where they came from the Anglo tradition. And that is based in Protestantism, because you can't just say it's an East West thing because it's not. This is what's so fascinating, because if you look at Catholic countries like France, or Spain or Orthodox countries like Greece in, in Europe, women have more status there as they get older. Whereas in pro traditionally Protestant countries, the Protestant work ethic, I think, is probably what is to blame. This is what I've discovered in my research. Your value is very much linked to your ability to work. So traditionally, women didn't work as much as men, so they were of less value. And as they got older, they certainly didn't work as much. So their value went down. So you can see, can't you, that there's a possibility that within our culture, therefore, you know, we see more gendered ageism. And we also, you know, we see the worst experience of menopause. I mean, I the, the UK um, has the worst experience, women report the worst experience of menopause of anywhere in the world. And I think you know, it's interesting, too, because you have a queen, the oldest, the longest serving uh, royalty in your country. And what an example of how yeah. how vital and effective you can be to a very old age. So yeah. that's kind of interesting that you have a female but, but we uh, in that position. Of we kind of, I think what we do is we, we put her on the pedestal and we say, well, that's the queen. But we don't actually apply what you've just said to every woman in society. Yeah. Yeah, what do you think about uh, social media as it relates? Because I think it's very harmful based on just the filters. So everybody's trying to filter out. I, I see younger women using filters that they don't even need to use. And that is to it, me disturbing because I'm like, when will they ever really accept who they really are? Um, so, so I, you know, I'd sometimes use filters. Somebody commented one day that, um, oh, you, you, I, it bothers me that you use filter. And in that case, I didn't even use a filter in the case that she was describing. So I thought it was funny, but it made me think going forward, how do I want to represent myself? Do I want to be a filtered version where when people actually meet me in person, they're like, oh, <laughs> you know, I don't want to be, I want to be perceived as who I really am. And so it does make me 
think and about how I want to be on social media. Well, I would love women to be able to age however they want to age. Um, And yet there is so much pressure Um, and we still see age as something to either deny, you know, cover up or, or fix and, and I think that is such a shame because, you know, I want women to be able to embrace their wrinkles. Men can get older. They can turn into silver foxes, you know, and I want women to be able to do that as well. And yet there is, you know, so many women feel they have to keep dyeing their hair just to stay in work, let alone trying to change a job. I mean, it's awful. And I just started doing some, I've just gone onto TikTok, actually. <laughs> I thought, let's go and check it out. And of course, I'm reaching quite a different audience on TikTok. Um, And I started doing some videos about aging and ageism. And the first one I did, I asked how old was the audience when they first learned that aging was bad? And I thought it was going to be like 20 or 30. And I even said, oh, maybe you were really lucky. And it wasn't till you were 40. I had one woman, she said I was five. She said, I saw an advert on the television for a face cream that would knock five years off my age. And I imagine myself disappearing completely. Wow. And, and another, another woman said, I was 13. My own mother told me to start using anti-aging products. I hate that word, anti-aging. Mm. I think it's as, to be anti-aging is about as useful as being anti-nighttime. We're all aging from the minute we're born. And, and why would you want to be anti-something that is such a fundamental part of you. Yeah. Talk about a narrative that sticks like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. and, and could cause a lot of damage to, you know, how you see yourself. Mm -hmm. I, I, there was this, I don't know how old I was, but I was young. I was probably 10, but there was this series called the twilight zone. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of it? I think that it's, it's, you can see reruns and stuff on Netflix, but I should probably try to find this episode, but I I never will. You know how there's a couple of episodes that you like remember Mm -hmm. forever. Mm -hmm. And it was a woman and she was fairly attractive woman and like a model kind of look. And she got some elixir and she, it, it kept her young. And so at some point you find out she's older than she really is, Mm -hmm. uh, but she had to keep taking it to stay young. And so she became desperate, you know, like an addict where like, and then one day she couldn't get it. I can't remember why she couldn't get it, but she couldn't get it. And so at the very end of the show, like the, the, the guy goes to her door and I don't know if it was a guy who was dating her. Yeah, I think it was somebody who was like dating her and she was like this young person and she, and she wouldn't open the door and he forced himself in. And she was like this old, like shriveled up woman because she hadn't had her elixir. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's so funny how that came back to me and how I was very young. I mean, I don't mm-hmm. think I had, you know, reached puberty yet. And that impressed upon me like this image of how aging is, you know, oh my gosh, you, you, you got to take the things to keep yourself young or you're going to get rejected. Cause clearly that was like, Oh, <gasps> when yeah. she, she revealed herself. Yeah. But it's so interesting. shocking, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's shocking. And this is the thing with ageism. So society will be ageist towards older women but older women will also be ageist. We will be ageist towards ourselves because we've internalized these messages. We will believe we're too old to do something. We'll be, we'll believe that we, we, you know, I was, I was brought up, you know, after 40, you can't have long hair. Well, you know, I have long hair. I'm not chopping my hair off anytime soon. And you have long hair too. too. I tell you that I have an appointment uh, on Saturday to get my hair done. And I have such a great hairdresser that she's so good at blending the color with my gray that you you really can't tell when it grows out. I mean, (laughs) people just think it's gray, but sometimes I'm like, it's blonde. It's, but um, I used to have like a track, you know, you could see when it was growing out. So I had to go in every six to eight weeks to get the color applied. So she has, I say, she's kind of worked herself out of a job because I don't, I haven't been into her, see her since March, but I decided 
that this time I'm just getting a haircut. I'm not getting it colored anymore. Like why do it if I can go, you know, eight months? Well, it's not eight months. March isn't eight months, but it's almost, it's, you know, half a year. If I can go half a year without getting my hair colored, I really don't need it colored anymore. So I'm celebrating the gray. Yeah. Yeah. I've done, I've done posts on my, uh, because I have an online magazine as well called The Mutton Club. And I've got um, a Silver Sisters post on there where, because there's a lot of Silver Sisters on Instagram that are just so inspirational, but it's, it's very interesting when they, because I asked them what, what were their key messages about going grey and embracing the grey and, you know, what did it feel like? And something that really struck me was that when you stop dyeing your hair as a woman, it's almost like turning gay or, or coming out the first time because you've got to keep coming out. You've got, because gay is not the norm, you've got to keep explaining to people that you're gay. Well, in the same way, if you're not dyeing your hair, it's like the, the influencers on social media, they are always having to deal with trolls saying you'd look 10 years younger if you dyed your hair. And they're like, well, I don't care. Go away. Wow. <laughs> but they and they we'll see if I get some it, trolls. They have to keep explaining this. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's I think it's shocking. This is why I have to actually I have to explain because I do, this is my natural hair color um, at 56. I have Which is brown. It's, brown. Well, then it's kind yeah. of reddish brown. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. why, because my mum's a redhead. Uh -huh. um, and uh, so I have some white hairs coming in in the fringe, which I'm really rather excited about. But I will, my mother at 88, she still has color in her hair. Well, yeah, my mom too. She's like in her inner 80s. So I, I got, mm. I don't know where I got mine from, but... Yeah, that's but it interesting. looks lovely. I love I and I think as well when women do embrace their natural color, it suits their skin tone better because we our skin tone changes as well as we get older. Yeah. Yeah. So so, so you mentioned a book and I, I saw a book mentioned in your your book that I also wanted to ask you about because I always like recommending good books for people. But um, I think you said it was called This Chair Rocks. This Chair Rocks. It's by Ashton Applewhite, who's the anti ageism activist. The, the full title is This Chair Rocks, A Manifesto Against Ageism. Oh. And it's brilliant. It, it completely changed the way I view aging. Cool. And is that Ashton? Is that a person from the UK? America. She's, oh, she's, she's okay. in Brooklyn, actually. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. And the book that you recommended, I actually went to um, Amazon because I was curious and I wanted to see what it was. Um, but you mentioned The Artist's Way. Oh, because, the artist's way. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned that. And I thought that was very interesting because um, she influenced you to start a, a daily journal writing yes. habit. Yes. So I was, that's one of the reasons because I, I encourage people to, to write and because it brings yeah. out a lot of, uh, you know, things that might not come out from their logical brain. So yeah, so tell me what led you to buy that book and how, how it changed you and what you do now that you didn't do before? Well, I'd heard about the book for many years before I actually read it. And um, I think it was around the time when I was starting to write my book and needing some mm. inspiration to sort of get the creative juices going. Yeah. Um, and I think it was, there was uh, actually a similar sort of time that I was doing it. And um, eventually I just thought, right, well, now's the time I've got to read this book and it's such a good um program it's like you know it's I think it's three months and it takes you through very structured exercises in each chapter and Elizabeth Gilbert um swears by it she says yeah yeah she no, was mentioned would be no eat pray love if she hadn't read the artist's way you know so I yeah. think the morning pages is the main thing in terms of the habit that I I got from it but I love that idea of just a free writing. So powerful that you just Yeah, it looks your... like there's a workbook you can do with it now. And yeah. um, it's in one of the workbooks. And, and maybe this is a different book because it's like a bundle. You can get all three. It's, it's never too late to begin again. That's good. I, I always like finding these things that I can <laughs> share with my audience. So, so cool. So, so you've written this book. When did it come out? In October last year. Oh, okay. And so are you, so you were kind of writing it in the pandemic. 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. So what's your plan with it? And what are you, what's, what are you looking forward to? What's I just, I just want everybody to read it. Yeah. <laughs> I really, really do because I wrote it because there wasn't anything else like it. Yeah. And, and people weren't listening to me. So I <laughs> thought I've got to write a book so that people can read it. And I've done an audio book as well. So I've actually recorded my own audio book. Wow. So, that's, I, I, I uh, interviewed a voice actress or actor. I don't think they call themselves actresses. They call themselves actors, but yeah. And uh, she was up for, uh, she was, she was part of a um, multiple, she was, it was a book that had more than one voice actor, like different chapters were different oh, yes. voice yeah, actors, yeah. but it was up for an Audi, which is the, you know, Academy Award version for audible books. Yeah. Or it was, it was very interesting, um, but mm-hmm. how how hard it is to narrate a book. Yeah, yeah, yeah but I loved it because I, yeah. I like telling stories, and I, I'm a podcaster as well. You know, so you yeah. get used to the sound of your own voice. And then what the one lesson I did learn, um, and I don't know where I got this from, but maybe I've just learned it myself. Was I actually read my book out loud to myself as I was editing it? Mm. Um, so when I went into the studio, I didn't need to make lots of changes because they said to me in the studio, usually when the author reads their own book, they're making lots of changes if it hasn't already been oh, printed. Oh, that's um, interesting. But uh, actually, I didn't because as I was proof, as I was you know checking it, the final take, I read it out loud. Yeah, I really like it's it when it. the author does do their own book, the narrating, because you then you feel like you're actually meeting the person you feel like you're Mm. in the room with the person and uh and when there's it's somebody else I mean I guess sometimes people might not have the best voices and they hire an actor who has a better voice but yeah I really I have a good voice yeah you you do it's very soft spoken (laughs) I I find myself I'm talking like too loud when you're and then you talk and you're like oh I'm like feeling like I'm talking too loud all right so now are you past menopause we didn't really talk too much about menopause I was kind of looking forward to it um do you have anything so my problem was big time hot flashes that were keeping me up at night so I did go on HRT and I did these patches for about six years but I went really really low dose because I was really Mm. afraid of I just didn't want to so I went down to as low of a dose where the hot flashes started coming back and then I like went up like a 0.25 so so I was just really careful about that but one of the things that I've had to deal with, and I'm sure a lot of my audience is the dry vagina, mm-hmm. which is, that is the, like the worst thing I think of all. I mean, hot flashes, granted, I was, it was keeping me up at night. So I was pretty exhausted. And it's when I was working mm-hmm. a corporate job as well. Um, so I was glad that, but I could, I, I felt like I could take care of it with that. Now I feel like I'm past the age of being allowed to be on HRT. And I, I feel like there's no solutions for my dry vagina. Can you have the localized hormone therapy? Uh, so something that. like a suppository? Yes. I think, yeah, my, my are, I have an appointment on creams. Friday. So there are, there are creams and there are suppositories. I call them mm-hmm. pessaries over here. Yes. Yeah. And those um, are thought to be almost entirely without risk. Um, and you can take those forever. Mm-mm. So I, yeah, I noticed you had a chapter on that. Those. So I was yes, like, oh, she, she must know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I have a dry vagina too. Oh, I know. <laughs> it's just terrible. <laughs> uh, but some women don't, you know, it, 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 I think it is very common and women don't like talking about it. So I would recommend the localized estrogen. I would also rec- uh, recommend a brilliant, um, get, a, get yourself a really good lubricant. Um, and don't be, uh, you know, worried about using them. I started off doing, going all organic with the lube and I've actually changed my tune. I now use a silicon one, which mm. goes by the name of Pure, P-J-U-R. Mm. Um, I think it was made in Germany originally. Um, but try silicon ones because they stay on the skin. They don't get absorbed and mm. just slather it on, you know, as mm. much as you like. <laughs> But the other thing is, I think, um, I don't know, I'm allowed to say this, but, and I have a podcast, I've just re-released it actually with Dr. Sonia Wright, who's the midlife sex coach. Um, so go and have a listen to that. There's a lot. Yeah. Of tips yeah. I was but, perusing and I did see her episode. <laughs> yeah. 
but as she says we need to get away from the fact from from thinking that sex is just penis in vagina sex p i v mm. sex because mm. sex can be all sorts of things um and it doesn't just have to be penetrative um and i do think that there is there's a lot of merit in thinking use it or lose it so we need to keep up stimulation to the vulval area mm. but if penetration is painful trying to use it so you don't lose it is just going to make it worse so don't go there but do i'm a big fan of vibrators and i don't know i just don't got to i just say these things on your podcast <laughs> why not <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big fan of vibrators i have a little egg vibrator which is brilliant and i think that all women need to think in terms of self-pleasure as self-care because it really is because you are keeping blood flowing to the area um, and you can introduce you know toys vibrators with a partner you can get creative about different forms of pleasure a man only has to have the very head of his penis inside the vagina to to orgasm or have have a great deal of pleasure he doesn't have to go all the way in you know <laughs> so and um, and obviously I'm only talking about heterosexual relationships and I think there is more understanding, you know, in a non-heterosexual relationship. But um, there's lots of things that you can try. Um, yeah. And, and if you can just, you know, stay open, stay curious, explore and take it back to pleasure, you know, take it what is going to give pleasure, mutual pleasure. And if penetration isn't where it's at right now, then, you know, take that off the agenda but try exploring, practicing, you know, getting some blood supply back to the area. And I definitely recommend the localized um, estrogen as well if things are really difficult. Yes. I have this theory. Well, I don't know how you gave birth, but I never gave birth vaginally. Yeah, so I did. It, I, I had two natural vaginal. Yeah, I was lucky. I had quick labors. So my I wasn't, theory does, I, I, didn't, my theory I don't like shots. Then. I don't like <laughs> shots. So that was, you know, I, people think I'm really brave. No, I'm not brave. I just hate <laughs> shots. So I made the choice and it was, and, and honestly, I see people going through 24 hours of labor. I, I probably would have ex accepted a shot if I had to deal with that. Mm. But So my theory doesn't hold any water, but I was thinking, well, it makes sense to me that, you know, my vagina isn't the most accommodating because it never expanded to accommodate a baby's head you know but so yeah it obviously yeah. doesn't work it, it yeah. doesn't make any difference yeah I mean this is conversations you know we, we don't really have and I think it's good and thanks for those recommendations and maybe the, hopefully my, my dry class. vagina audience will will, <laughs> will, it will help someone <laughs> but the how, how to have great sex in midlife and beyond that podcast it literally it was out last week I think I re-released it as part of my summer season it's a definite go have a listen to that yeah and yeah and your podcast is that. also magnificent midlife right because I, yes. I know I googled it and found it very easily yeah. okay yeah. yeah awesome well thank you so much for being here do you have any last words like um you know it, it clearly you shifted um you became very passionate about what happened to you in your life and yeah. you became very knowledgeable this is a very common theme with my guests yeah. um it, 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 something in life takes them down a path that maybe they wouldn't have chosen, but they, they went down that path for a reason. Mm. And then they become almost experts, but we don't think we, we devalue ourselves, you know, because we think, oh, I don't know enough, but if you know more than, and it can help somebody, then you should, you should share it. So you, you definitely um, had this kind of midlife pivot. So what would you say to somebody who's um, kind of in that space where um they're kind of learning something new they want to share it they're afraid to do it they think they don't know enough but they do um what, what kind of guidance or suggestion would you give to those people i think it's all about self-belief um i think you have to believe that you can um and if you don't believe that you can pretend that you believe that you can fake it till you make it but I'd love to tell your listeners about the whales. May I may I tell them about the whales? Sure, tell them about a, the whales. It's a big, big part of my story. Are we talking about whales country or the whales? No, the, the whales, the, the whales. Orca the whales. Okay. The orca yeah. whales. So 
um, when I wrote my book, um, when I found out about the whales, they thought there were only two creatures that go through menopause, human females and whales. They now think that maybe giraffes do and also elephants. Well, when whales go through menopause, they become the leaders of their pods, often for up to 50 years. The younger male whales, they die off, but not the females. Five um, zero she, years? Up to 50 years, yeah. Wow. A female whale can live to 100, yeah, and, and go through menopause, you know, about at age 50, roundabout. And uh, there's another book, um, Flash Count Diary, written by Darcy Steinke, and I've interviewed her on my podcast as well. And and she introduced me to the whales because she became obsessed with finding Granny, who was known as J2, but otherwise known as Granny. And she actually got in a kayak and she paddled out and she met Granny. And she could tell it was Granny because you can identify whales from their dorsal fin. But she credits meeting this whale and learning this about the whale with not only transforming her emotional response to menopause and getting older, but her physical symptoms as well, because suddenly she was this whale and she could go off and lead her pod. And you could extrapolate for women that as we get older, we are of more value to our communities as leaders than as breeders. And that, oh, for that's me, so good. It just, it shifts the whole perspective on the third act or the next magnificent chapter, whatever it is that we're going to call it, how powerful we can be. And we have the same experience and wisdom as the female whales who are leading their pods. And whether we just choose to lead in our family or in our immediate community, on our street or in our town, our city, the world, whatever, the world needs us. It really, the world is a mess. And it's been made a mess by men. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm not anti-men. I love men, you know. But the men have made a mess. Women don't generally start wars. Mm. We, we, yeah. we talk, you know. So I think the world needs more feminine energy as a whole, but it particularly needs us older women. So don't doubt yourself. The world needs what it is that you have. And, and say that again, I've had you start it. It, it. You said you're, you have more value as a leader than a breeder. We're more, we're more but, value to our communities as older women, as leaders than as breeders. That is so powerful. I love that. It's good, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That is so I good. I say that a lot because it's just, but it's transformational when you think of getting older like that. Mm -hmm. everything shifts doesn't it oh yeah. Me, it just, yeah just shifted yeah that's so great yeah and I think you know it becomes when when you believe that you have something that can help your community it becomes bigger than you right it mm -hmm. becomes this kind of mission-based uh desire and I think that's that's really powerful too so thank you for that gem that was great. You're very welcome. Uh, so, yeah, it's a very much a quote I need to use. Um, mm -hmm. I, like when I share quotes. Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. Don't talk about the wilds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thanks so much for being here and sharing your wisdom. And um, I'll put the different books we talked about, including yours, in the show notes, and people will have uh, some things to choose from. And the book Glorious. about the whales, definitely too. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. 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 It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for tuning into the Not Your Average Lives podcast. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe on iTunes if you have an Apple device. You can find free resources and learn what else I have going on at the moment that might interest you on my website at notyouraveragegrandma.com. You can also find me on Instagram or Facebook at Not Your Average Grandma. If you liked this episode, it would make my heart so happy if you could leave me a five-star rating. You can also add a review to let me know what you like about this podcast, which will help spread the word about it to others who need a little midlife inspiration. As always, be you, listen to your inner voice, and focus on reigniting that lost spark so you can start living your own Not Your Average life.